Morning everyone and this is the third in our series of lectures for NRS 123. This uh, week we're looking at consent in clinical practice. So chapter 4 in your text is the basis of all readings essentially but also as always make sure that you work your way through the material and activities contained in your module. So after completing this uh, module the objectives or learning outcomes that you should gain or understand include uh, understanding why consent is important and the elements that constitute a valid consent. So you'll note that there are three elements that uh, must be uh, considered or in place uh, to ensure that a consent that we gain from a patient is actually valid. Uh, important that you understand the nurse's role when obtaining consent and when we talk about when perhaps um, particularly signing witness forms, who's responsible and so on. We'll just introduce you to some of the issue in relation to legal capacity and um, importantly understand patient rights when refusing treatment and just have an awareness of the one of the civil wrongs uh, of false imprisonment and that relates to you know, when patients perhaps are vulnerable, being held against their will and so on. We'll just touch on all of those. It's a very large chapter. There's a lot to consent, but again, be guided by what I highlight or your lecturer highlights in the, um, the tutorial exercises and what we actually focus on throughout the, the module. All right. So let's begin by looking at Firstly, why consent is so important. And I think we're looking at it from a purely legal perspective, but it's important to just look at the, the process of gaining consent. And it harps back to that interaction, first interaction that you'll have with a patient, all about introducing yourself and sort of that um, therapeutic communication. So from the first instance, from the you know, the main principle about gaining consent and why it's so important to us as nurses is it's respectful and it should be undertaken as a matter of course for all health professionals, regardless if you're a social worker or a doctor or a podiatrist or whatever. Um, but it's just a matter of being respectful and that again alludes to the principle, the ethical principle of autonomy that, um, you know, that we are always, even though we're in a healthcare environment, we're trying to do the best for our patients, but it's always, you know, all things being equal, um, that they are, you know, consenting to that um, and that you are gaining their permission. So obtaining consent from a patient before touching them converts what would otherwise amount to, well, in legal terms, an assault and or battery against that person. So when we look at consent from a legal person, it actually comes under that tort of trespass to a person. A tort is a French word simply meaning a civil wrong. So in law, uh, we gain consent because we're touching patients every day, we're doing things with them, and if we don't automatically gain their consent, um, then Theoretically, we could be guilty of um, committing trespass to that person. So the tort of battery is when you actually unlawfully come into contact or physical contact with a person or patient or, in other words, a plaintiff. This is under the civil jurisdiction usually. The tort of assault deals with cases where the patient is caused to you know, um, feel threatened in some way, but mo more than likely assault and or battery go together. And then just at the end there, under the tort of uh, trespass, you've also got false imprisonment, which is that unlawful detainment. So consent, very, very important. And that's why in NRS uh, 112, NRS 122, in your clinical subjects, there's a great focus on, you know, stressing the importance of communicating properly with your patients. All right. So you are, again, 
from a professional perspective, but also from a legal perspective, you are gaining their consent. Now let's look at the different types of consent. All right, so uh, implied consent, that's given when a patient will offer an arm, for example, or given by the action or posture that they, um, you know, sort of present to you. You know, it's the same when they're, if you're doing a wound dressing and then they sort of, you know, if it's on their back, they'll turn over for you, that sort of thing. That's um, implied consent. But just a note, it can be problematic when clinicians rely solely on non-verbal behaviour or to underpin that their, um, their therapeutic communication is less than satisfactory. If they're not going through the proper channels and doing it properly every time, because if you're right, rely solely on non-verbal behavior mistakes can be made for example particularly with uh, non-english speaking background you know some from cultural backgrounds different body postures different mannerisms mean different things particularly in high acuity areas like emergency departments where you know there's not clarity of sort in the the verbal um you know, sort of gaining of consent, a lot of things can go wrong. Possibility for confusion, um, particularly when the patient's unfamiliar with the treatment or the procedure and you misinterpret their behaviour as consent. Uh, so it's always good practice to, clip, to seek clear direction from the patient that they are consenting uh, and so on. So the Hart v. Heron case, and uh, you can look that up yourself, but just Google that. But certainly that was when a patient presented to a hospital uh, in an emergency department and uh, he actually sued uh, for damages because, um, well, it came down to the consent. Basically, the health professionals treated him on the basis that merely presenting to a hospital they undertook to be in fact consenting but no it's just because a patient presents to an emergency department doesn't negate the fact that you have to actually uh, gain their consent so that's implied consent you've got to be very careful and it's always best to to seek um, verb, verbal approval as well just to be on the safe side now there's verbal consent this is the most common form of consent, sometimes known as express consent. Um, and for an example, uh, you would be in a clinical situ situation if a nurse was un going to undertake a procedure such as a, a complex wound dressing, you will inevitably explain what you're going to do, describe how you're going to do it. You might elicit the patient's assistance, should that be necessary, and the patient will usually verbally agree to the process. They, that gives them the opportunity to seek clarification about anything they're unclear about um, and then they can provide you with whatever assistance is necessary to carry out that dressing. Uh, obviously more invasive procedures, uh, consent uh, verbally is gained in the surgeon's rooms and then usually it's written signed off there as well but verbal consent is the most common form of consent that occurs in relation to many procedures. Now written consent. The main function that a written consent fulfills is to express in writing what has been verbally agreed to between parties and it's important to realize that just because it it's uh, there's a document that's signed by a patient does not necessarily mean that that consent is is valid. Um, all it is is written. It's generally nothing more than documentary evidence of what has already been consented to verbally by the patient. Uh, so, should a dispute arise, the fact that um, you know, and the, the most famous case that you will look at in relation to that is, um, uh, what's it called? Oh, the next one. Sorry, guys, just hang on. Apologies for that. I oh, just had a mental blank. But the, um, the major case that we look at where consent was actually um, 
closely scrutinise is Rogers v Whitaker, and we'll look at that uh, a little bit later. So, yes, just to refresh your refresh that point, written consent in no way guarantees that the consent given is a valid one. That's another issue completely. Uh, so it's only true to say that a consent form is only as good or as valid as the quality of the consent that has been made and that it represents. It's the validity of the consent that goes to the heart of any uh, procedural requirements and not the signing of a piece of paper. So that's important to just remember, all right? So a lot of people tend to just say, well, it's been written, so it must be legal, it's binding, but no, it's just back up for um, that verbal consent. Validity, assessing validity of the consent is a much, much more um, in-depth process, which we'll look at it in a minute. So what are the elements of uh, that constitute consent being valid? Well, there are essentially three elements, and we'll go through those, that it's got to be freely and voluntarily given, it's got to be properly informed, and the person giving consent has got to have capacity. So the first one, when consent is freely and voluntarily given, it must be without fraud, duress or coercion. And unfortunately, in the annals of healthcare, there's lots and lots of examples uh, that, um, you know, have illustrated that consent has, on the part of patients, has been fraudulently obtained, coerced or not fully informed. One of the most famous cases at this Chelmsford Hospital, which was a mental health hospital, mental health um, in Sydney, and there was a Royal Commission into deep sleep therapy. That's a very interesting case. Uh, you can look that one up. It um, There was actually a Royal Commission into that. Hello again, sorry, just paused again another interruption so <laughs> bear with me sometimes when you're recording in your room this can happen anyway back to consent is freely and voluntarily given so I think I explained that uh, what is meant here is that any consent given by a patient must be given without any fraud duress or coercion being applied by either the medical practitioner another member of staff in order to obtain a patient's consent now as a general rule medical or nursing staff they don't deliberately seek to apply fraudulent or coercive measures on patients to obtain their consent but unfortunately can do so in unwittingly uh, in a variety of ways for example if a health practitioner advises a patient that he or she must have a particular form of treatment or else he or she will be discharged, for example. So there's lots of examples of um, where things like that can happen. And as I said, the, the Chelmsford uh, Royal Commission into the Deep Sleep Therapy, uh, which investigated the practice of a psychiatrist and his colleagues uh, who looked after mentally ill patients um, and gave them special treatment where they had a barbiturate and it was an induced coma and it was just dreadful there was no consent there was no uh it wasn't voluntarily given it was coercive it was just dreadful so that's something that you can look at and there's always cases of dreadful examples to illustrate uh, bad practice and where we must um, continue to you know strive for best practice in this area so that's when consent is freely and voluntarily given. Now, in relation to uh, the, the second uh, principle of validity in being fully informed, how much information must be given? Patients must be provided with sufficient information. Uh, and there's the, I won't read the entire thing, but that's from the New South Wales Department of Health Policy on consent for patients. And the link for that document, policy document, is in your module. Really, really informative uh, document for all nurses and health practitioners working in uh, public hospitals. But, um, you know, the, the trial case that we look at, and I'll just click the link here, hopefully it comes up. 
and um, yes, now I've got to bring it over. Mm. The High Court of Australia. Sorry, guys, I can't bring that over to my screen. But if you click on the Rogers v Whitaker, if you just put this link or this um, reference into your browser, it will take you to the High Court of Australia. Um, decision that was made on this case. Essentially, just to really quickly summarise it, it is in your text as well, but um, Mrs. Uh, Rog Mrs. Rog Mrs. Whitaker was a, a woman who had a problem with her eye, uh, and the Dr. Rogers was her treating ophthalmic, ophthalmic <laughs> you know, ophthalmologist, uh, or the surgeon, who uh, operated on her eye and unfortunately um, she one of the risk factors that she suffered from sympathetic ophthalmalgia was where you operate on one eye and then the other eye due to the optic nerve and everything actually she went blind in her good eye as well now she sued uh, Dr Rogers because on the basis of uh, the quality of the consent that she said that if she'd known that there was a chance that this condition could have occurred she would never have consented to the operation and she was actually successful she was awarded damages of in excess of eight hundred thousand dollars it happened back it's a test case it was a major case uh, and it happened back in the 80s but um, it clearly il illustrates and it's the one that um, when we're talking about um, you know, consent must be fully informed. This is the one that lawyers will refer to that, um, you know, the, the extent of that information. Failure to properly advise and inform could amount to a breach of a doctor's duty of care, which it did for Dr. Rogers in that case. He did appeal. He appealed to the Supreme Court and that was overturned. And then he appealed finally to the High Court and uh, uh, it was um, thrown out there as well. So he had to pay costs. So poor Dr. Rogers, you know, he there was no doubt he did his best on operating on her eye, but just sent a warning that in terms of providing consent, it must be fully informed. And for many of you, if you're having surgery or know your relatives, you'll know how much, well, they should go into that in their treating rooms. They go through absolutely everything. All right, so let's move on to the next one. Who's responsible for providing information? This causes a lot of confusion sometimes, so I'll just clear this up. Responsibility for informing a patient of treatment um, primarily less with, rests with the treating doctor. And um, I think a lot of nurses um, sometimes can presume that if they're it's rare that you're asked to do this but um, you know you could be at one point asked to be a signatory to a consent form but it's important to realize that that's all you're doing is that you're merely witnessing that signature it in no way denotes uh, responsibility or culpability in relation to providing um, a fully informed consent that responsibility rests primarily with the doctor so yes um, usually that will occur in the doctor's rooms if it's a, obviously a, a, a more serious or more invasive procedure and usually the consent form the verbal consent will be gained and then the form is signed so just always remember that that's a point who's responsible for providing information it usually rests with the the treating doctor um, and it should be witnessed by the treating doctor and if you do witness it it is argued that's what it is you're just a witness to the signature not you know responsible for the consent issue okay now I suppose it's just um, in terms of coming up with consent forms and you know particularly for nurses working in uh, uh, theatre and everything else. Uh, you do have um, a professional responsibility to educate and provide secondary information about treatment. Um, obviously this is part of your advocacy role, your educative role. 
But if you've got any outstanding issues of concern about a patient, immediately should be brought to the, cons the, the attention of the treating doctor. So, for example, if, you know, having worked in theatre before, if you're doing anaesthetics and, you know, you're, you're checking your patient through the, the whole um, consent procedure just as they're coming in and you find out that they're a little confused, it's not your role to sort of, um, you know, explain to that depth. That's the role of the doctor. Certainly if it's to know how, you know, what they can eat or how long they might be nil by mouth or, you know, that sort of thing, definitely. Um, and advocate them in terms of comfort or care or anything like that. But if it's to do with the procedure, the responsibility to inform is always the doctor. So remember that. Capacity to consent. This is a really, really complex area, guys. But it simply means the concept of legal capacity. Remember this third element for a consent to be valid means an adult of sound mind is competent to make decisions about their treatment. Now, there are a number of components or lists of abilities, and it's in uh, Chapter 4, page 128 of your text. And those sort of summarising that when capacity is being measured, if you like, it's someone's ability to recall relevant information. They've got to have the ability to integrate the information, uh, evaluate the benefits and risks, communicate the choice to others and and so on um, and you can recognize where this area can be a little bit uh, tricky particularly when someone for example who for example might have uh, a cognitive impairment or something like that and this is where we look at legislation governs who has authority consent and that'll be the guardianship act when someone has reduced mental capacity that's where you know that uh, legislation uh, enables carers, uh, loved ones or someone designated to have that role to, to sort of consent on someone's behalf. So have a look at that. Um, again, we touch on that throughout the session, but uh, capacity to consent uh, is certainly to do with that uh, mental cognition and ability and the set of abilities or components are on page 128 of your text. Another area that can be a little tricky as well is age and consent. Now, legal capacity in Australia is generally, well, it's it's denoted as 18 years. Now, it depends what state you're in, but for, in, for example, in New South Wales, uh, a young person uh, under the uh, Young Persons Act, you know, Minors Property and Contracts Act, they are denoted from 16 to 18 as a young person. Um, then a minor is someone who's 12 to 16 and a child's below that. And, you know, but it varies from state to state. However, in most states through legislation, a person 16 or over can legally consent to treatment if they are capable of understanding, meaning that they have that capacity which we outlined earlier. In New South Wales, and it's dependent on a case-by-case -case basis, it can be 14 years under Section 49 of that minors property act it is a very complex area guys um, and you know for health professionals particularly doctors it's a, a serious matter when they've got uh, someone who's a, a minor who's particularly when it comes to you know when you know their guardian or their parents they're going against their parents and and so on um, you know, but there's guidelines for doctors on how to do that and, and sort of guide young people through. And I suppose whenever there's a big blanket approach, everyone 14 um, can consent. It's a, usually a case cut by case basis. But for your purposes, um, I think, you know, that legal capacity in Australia is generally classed in law as the age of 18. But in most states, um, and, and territories a person 16 or over can legally consent to treatment and in New South Wales and again dependent on the maturity and capacity of a young person it can be 14 years so have a read what Staunton has to say about that as well.
most importantly, we're looking at when consent is not required, guys, uh, because obviously we're talking about when consent's required, you should always do it, but we'll talk about this in the tutes and you need to know this, but the conditions where consent's not required, obviously when we'll look at this when we do mental health, but an involuntary patient is someone who has uh, been deemed mentally ill or mentally disordered under the Mental Health Act and of course the capacity is lacking and obviously if they need care, treatment, control under the Mental Health Act, we can, um, you know, treat them in, provided they meet the criteria. Uh, without the consent. Under the Public Health Act, there's certain notifiable diseases, for example, brucellosis, um, AIDS, SARS, all of those sorts of things. So certain public, when it's a risk to the public health, um, consent's not required. Emergency situations under the doctrine of necessity. Uh, statutory provisions, and you'll do this in the tutorial, for example, under the Roads and Traffic Act, if someone's in an accident, and um, they need to give blood or compulsory drug testing and they've got to give an alcohol or blood reading you, you know they ask for your consent but if you f refuse under legislation you know you have to do it or you'll be you know charged or you'll face some um, you know uh, a legal situation and obviously under the children and young persons care and protection act when um, protection of children, when the suspected child abuse, um, yeah, with parents and investigations there, consent's not required. So there's a number of those as well. So just summarising that. Now you'll remember from the beginning that I spoke about that third arm of the tort of trespass. So under in the consent you've got, if you don't gain consent, you could be theoretically charged with assault and battery, mm, sounds awful, but also under that civil wrong of false imprisonment comes under trespass to a person and that's the wrongful and intentional application of a restraint upon someone which restricts their freedom to move or confines them. So um, that should be 2017, sorry guys that's that old one, but anyway, um, so this is why policy on restraining someone or secluding someone are very, very clear. Um, but false imprisonment is a serious matter. And um, yes, it can be uh, sort of um, breached in a number of ways. And it's not just when you actively res physically restrain someone against their will, but also if you put in the mind of someone that they can't actually leave for example, to give you an example, say someone's in the emergency department and they've been treated, all right, and um, then they, you know, they have to provide their Medicaid card or pay a bill or something like that, and then, you know, the doctor says, you can't leave till you pay this bill. That can effectively constitute false imprisonment imprisonment. It's enough if the patient believes that they're not free to go and it must be intentional and complete. You know, from to give you another little example, say that a lecturer was giving you a lecture and, um, you know, closed all the doors and everything else and said you are unable to get out of here. If the students believe they were unable to, that's false imprisonment. So as well as the wrongful and intentional app, physical application of a restraint where someone restricts their freedom, it's putting in the mind. So look up false imprisonment, which all comes under the the consent issue, the tort of trespass to a person. So when you breach consent, assault, battery, and then there's that other civil wrong of false imprisonment. All right, so just a quick summary there of the main areas, guys. An understanding of the legislative parameters surrounding consent is vital for all healthcare professionals. Complete chapter uh, four in your text and engage in the corresponding activities and particularly on um, your exercises. Okay, thank you.